Hey everybody, this is Dr. Maples. Today we're going to continue our lectures on social change in Appalachia by unpacking and refuting some of these long-standing stereotypes that we have about Appalachia, particularly the idea that it's economically backwards, rural, that it is predominantly white, and that it consists of Scots-Irish immigrants. All of these being things that are flawed at best and honestly incorrect assumptions. Got a lot to do today. Let's get started. As a political economist, when I think about this idea that Appalachia's economy is backwards, I understand that we actually had some amazing economic stuff happening. It's that we got an unequal return on the investment. Um, in all of these cases above, we're going to see that we were sort of providing the resource, but we're not getting the funds back from that resource. In fact, this is an idea that we're going to revisit later in our course, trying to understand the relationship between coal and economic growth. You know, first off, we can think about coal. Um, when we think about the extraction of coal in West Virginia and in Eastern in Kentucky, this was an industry that fueled the growth in the United States because the coal was extracted from these areas and sent to large urban centers and even abroad to basically support growth in other places. What happened here, unfortunately, is we didn't see necessarily the return on that investment to these areas. In fact, a lot of the coal camps were designed to be abandoned over time when the coal would inevitably run out. The same thing kind of happens with the timber industry. You know, there was so much of eastern Kentucky being timbered that Congress basically steps in in 1911 to create the idea of public land so that we can protect timber stands across the United States over concerns that it's all going to get extracted so quickly. In fact, that ends up giving us the Cumberland National Forest, later called the Daniel Boone National Forest, which is where the Kentucky's Red River Gorge is, an area that we'll talk a lot about later in the semester. Um, technology was also a thing here, too. You know, like we can think about the Tennessee Valley Authority and the dams that were being created. You know, our farmlands, our cemeteries, our communities, and more were being given over to create electricity for lots of different places by flooding areas, making reservoirs, and creating hydropowered dams. We can also think even on a separate sense too that the railroad expansion into these areas was also creating it so that all these resources could easily be taken out. Uh, maybe not so much with the hydropower, but again, the railroads were important technological advance. And in the coming years, too, we're going to see some demographic things. You know, we were providing out of Appalachia the human power that would power all this manufacturing stuff that was happening. Um, all these mass-produced goods, you know, lots of Appalachian people were leaving behind their home areas and moving to places like Illinois because of the factory jobs. In fact, again, that's something that happened in my immediate family as well. So this is a time of when, you know, when we think about Appalachia's economy is being backwards, it's really a flawed perspective. We were pumping out tons of resources from our region, but we weren't getting the return back on that investment. Keep that idea in mind as we go forward because we're going to come back to it. We also have to toss out the idea that Appalachia is rural. I mean, fun fact, Appalachia has plenty of cities. Pittsburgh, Birmingham, Asheville, Huntsville, Johnson City, Tennessee, Knoxville, Chattanooga, Winston-Salem, North Carolina. These are all urban Appalachian areas. And you've even got the big cities on the cusp too, Nashville, Atlanta, Cleveland. Their metros overlap with Appalachia and would be considered kind of part of that story. Um, you know, when we think about rural Appalachian counties, it's actually only about a quarter of the counties in Appalachia. And on top of that, too, that's only about a tenth of the population. By and far, Appalachia means urban areas, which are relevant to these cities. And it's an important part of our history, too, because, again, most of these places were big manufacturing centers in their day, and that's a big part of their story. So we have to break apart even that idea that Appalachia is a rural area. And, hey, I'll be the first to tell you, as an Appalachian kid growing up in a holler, you know, I thought of rural Appalachia as being all of it. You know, the mountain cabins of my ancestors up in Cades Cove were exactly what I envisioned all of Appalachia looking like. But we got to break that apart. It's actually some very big, thriving cities, and it's right on the cusp of some big metro areas. I also want to revisit the idea of white Appalachia. Um, first off, the first Appalachian people would have been indigenous people. These would have been the people living here 12,000 plus years ago who were hunting small game, uh, gathering plants, and so forth, and also establishing our earliest idea of what our garden would have been. In fact, this is something that we'll revisit a little later in the semester as we learn more about the Red River Gorge in Kentucky. Um, 
we have to think about the Holocene, a period of change in which the environment was warming in places like Kentucky again. And this caused the conifers, pine trees, to basically fall away in favor of deciduous hardwood trees. These deciduous trees had small nuts like acorns on them and that favored small game. So we start seeing a lot more of stuff like deer and chipmunks instead of trying to hunt like big game, like say a woolly mammoth. And who wants to walk through the woods and see a woolly mammoth? Nobody, right? Um, we can also think too about some exciting cultural changes that were happening at the time. Um, first off, everything was starting to be named um, by indigenous people. This includes even the origins of the word Appalachian. Um, but we can also see too a period of political change. You know, as the situation with the American colonies changes, explorers go further and further into indigenous lands and begin renaming things. In fact, one of the really big ones involves again that word. Cumberland. A great example of this renaming process would be the Warrior's Path. So if I talk about the Warrior's Path, you probably wouldn't know that I was talking about the Cumberland Gap. But this was something that was renamed by white settlers who came through the area. You know, the Warrior's Path, roughly translated from Path of the Armed Ones, was an indigenous trail that was used for hunting, but also for raiding other indigenous communities. And it was something that as white settlers came through, they renamed it the Cumberland Gap, which is a name that's weird in and of itself we'll save that for another day. There's also lots of stereotypes that were developed too of indigenous people as being dangerous, as being sort of less than human, and all sorts of other horrible things. In fact, looking back at a lot of the scholars of that era, it was almost as if they saw these as like not humans. Um, we can also think too of removal acts and the Trail of Tears as being political situations where people were physically removed because they were indigenous. And note that the Removal Act has a term that isn't exactly clearly used today, so that's why we're rolling with the word indigenous for those wondering. Um, you know, today when we look at Appalachia, it's got at least 23 native land territories that I could find, and that was just me using the Appalachian Trail overlap as an example of that. Uh, there's certainly more of that, and we also have to remember too that there were entire communities that were eradicated because of genocide, relocation, and so forth. I will say that in recent years we have seen an increase in indigenous people's rights to land being acknowledged particularly in the rock climbing community, which we'll study a lot later this semester. Um, and their role in history is being revisited and also being examined through um, a sort of non-colonialist lens, if one will. So it's important for us to realize that the roots for this idea of Appalachia are rooted in indigenous people. And it doesn't stop just with indigenous people. We have to acknowledge that people who identify as African, African American, and or black at different historical moments are a critical and important part of Appalachian history. Slavery is a great example of that. People were forcibly brought to the United States to work for no resources. They were exploited, something that would continue through future generations, even post-slavery, and something honestly that's very much part of the idea of Appalachia and its rich cultural history of being exploited. This is something that's in part and parcel with the idea of being Appalachia, yet it's largely been eradicated. Pre-Civil War, there was an estimate that 10% of Appalachia included people who would have been identified at that time as black. We can also think, too, about the cultural contributions. You know, the civil rights movement is linked through parts of Appalachia. Birmingham is a great example of that. And Berea College, a location which actually, because of segregation laws, created a separate college for people of color and then mended them back together uh, once those laws were seen as being immoral and also wrong and simply thrown out. Um, on top of that, too, I mean, we would see that people who were freed slaves post-Civil War were still exploited in the coal mines. In fact, we'll see situations where people were being brought under sort of very dubious circumstances and dropped off in the middle of West Virginia after getting a train ride and having no idea where they were but largely being put to work for low wages. If you need another example of the fact that Appalachian history is rooted in the history of people of color, look up the Nagoni. It is the singular most identified cultural instrument of Appalachia, yet you probably didn't know it had its roots through Africa and Egypt, right? This is kind of a great example of how all this comes back. And we're seeing a change now. Uh, scholars like Frank X. Walker are now using the term Afrolachian to try and recapture this history and document it. 
And yet we're still fighting a lot of this because the textbooks that I see other professors using to study Appalachian studies still largely eradicate the people of color from this history. So it's one of those things that I'm hoping in our class that we can at least talk about. So what about Scots-Irish people in Appalachia? Well, that is a thing, but it's not as big as I was taught it was when I was a kid. You know, growing up, I thought that all people in Appalachia were Scots-Irish. And boy, is that wrong. There is some history of that. Um, it's difficult to understand, too, how people would have identified if we were able to ask them. Um, so let's go back in time a little bit. Um, first off, we do see lots of people who have been identified as Scots-Irish migrating to the United States pre-American Revolution. 1718 to 1774, uh, that's quarter million Scots-Irish people coming to the United States. And even earlier than that, we see people coming because of the Protestant Revolution by Charles I um, to the United States that they would have more religious freedom. Um, there were lots of famous early Americans that were Scottish by origin. Um, Alexander Hamilton, anyone? He was Scottish. We always think about him as sort of being an American. Tricky thing is he was actually born in the West Indies. So we start to see where like national and race identities kind of start crossing up in all sorts of different ways. And, you know, how strong does a cultural background have to be if you weren't born in that country? It raises all sorts of issues that are beyond today's conversation. But suffice to say, we have to understand that this idea of the white uh, Scots-Irish person being the identity of Appalachia, it's kind of flawed. Now, I will say some of the early white people, white with an asterisk, because we don't really know exactly how they would have identified people drifting into Appalachia include John Letter uh, ventured into the Shenandoahs with others in 1669 as an early colonist. Uh, Thomas Walker, um, also a doctor like John Letterer was, um, he drifted into um, parts of Kentucky, including the Wilderness Trail, which would end up being renamed the Cumberland Gap around 1750. In fact, he's the guy who brought that word Cumberland to the region. We'll explore that in a later lecture, as promised. Uh, we also have Daniel Boone, who came through uh, the Cumberland Gap area, area, establishes this wilderness trail and all sorts of other things. Uh, well, <laughs> he established a trail that had already been established. So did he really establish it? Sorry, I'm probably making lots of people angry. I should stop. The thing that I want to get to here is that uh, I now understand that the history of Appalachia is really the story of immigrants. Um, so many of the people who come into Appalachia post-Indigenous communities are immigrants. They are people coming from other places to try to start a new life here. Um, one of the big things, too, that we have to remember is that throughout Appalachian history, we see situations of exploitation happening with resources, something we'll revisit again and again and again. And this is partly of that. We see a lot of sociological literature pointing out that immigrants are in a situation that they can be exploited. And so who knows, that may have actually set some tones for these early exploitations that are going to visit uh, throughout our class. All right, Dr. Maples, you've ruined everything about Appalachia, right? So surely to goodness, we at least had the feuds, right? Well, yeah, but <laughs> there were some feuds. There was some fighting. The Hatfield-McCoy thing became synonymous with Appalachia, and the expectation was that this was just the Wild West, uh, which is in of itself a myth. And this idea that like everybody was just carrying guns and fighting with people and killing each other's cousins and family and stuff like that, it's just not very accurate. I will say this, the Civil War fractured a lot of communities and a lot of families as people picked between these sides, or in some cases stood neutral, and that even of itself was a problematic side. Um, second, I will say that when you have small towns, we have always seen that these are places that have their own weird power dynamic. If you've ever lived in a small rural community, you'll understand that there are people that just have power and it's often family related and we don't understand why, but they're able to do stuff that other people aren't able to. So a lot of the situation of these feuds was built around people trying to protect their own resources. I'll point out, too, that guns were a functional tool. People carried them because we hunted. We needed them for that kind of stuff. And honestly, you know, there was a certain element of carrying them for safety when you're in the woods because 
sometimes animals don't want you to be there. And there was a lot more of them back then than there are now. Um, policing also just didn't really operate the same way as it did today because, you know, you couldn't just call the police. You would have to basically go down to the city or the town or whatever to the sheriff's department or whatever if you had one or, like, try to put in connections to get one from the next town. It wasn't something that they could call the police and they come. You often had to take care of things yourself. And to a certain degree, you had to take care of your family. So, yeah, the feuds were problematic. They existed, but they were actually pretty really minimal. And if I'm being honest, there was really two cases in Appalachia, and then there's a whole bunch in others in, like, Texas. For example, uh, let's look at the Hatfield McCoy. It caused 12 deaths, got sensationalized, became the story of Appalachia, right? What about the Lee Pe uh, Peacock family feud that killed over 50 people? The Sutton Taylor feud in Texas killed at least 35 people. The Horrell Higgins feud in Texas, I'm seeing a theme here, are you? Killed at least 14. The Lincoln County feud in West Virginia, the only other feud that I could really find in Appalachia killed four people. So yeah, there was some feuds, but to think it's an Appalachian thing, not really. Now we didn't have feuds. We weren't an all white Scots Irish community. We're not even all rural. In fact, all these things we've kind of shown are just sort of misunderstandings, misinterpretations, or just wrong. What we do have are social problems. Uh, Appalachia's history, particularly when we're talking about the Cumberland central area of Appalachia, has a long, long history of social problems that we're going to have to unpack this semester. Concentrated poverty over generations has caused a lot of issues where there just aren't a lot of opportunities for people living in some parts of Appalachia. We see uneven disease rates. This is a situation where people don't have access to medical care, or they can't afford it, or they don't have health insurance, or they don't have jobs that provide health insurance, and basically they delay care, uh, they put off things that could be treated easily, until they become like a major life-changing situation or a major heart attack uh, and so forth. So because of the delayed care and all these different issues, we have lots of issues in health in Appalachia, particularly in central Appalachia, that Cumberland area. Um, food deserts are a thing too. We have parts of Appalachia where it's hard to get access to fresh, unpackaged, not full of salt food. Um, I can remember, in fact, some of the work that I was doing in very rural West Virginia, where we basically lived out of a gas station for a week because I had the foolish idea that there was just going to be a Walmart within 15, 20 minutes drive. And there wasn't. It was going to be like an hour there and an hour back to get to it. So basically, it was living out of a gas station. And I came to find out that's actually not that strange for a lot of people. It's also very expensive. So it kind of contributes to some of that poverty. We also see things like sacrifice zones, entire swaths of Appalachia that have been set aside for resources that have gone to other places, many of our coal mine situation, mountaintop removal, some of the pollution that we've experienced from um, the uh, retention ponds breaking in coal mines, the timbering, you name it. These are all problems that stay with Appalachia long after the resources have left. And that money doesn't always stay here. It often ends up being the property of people who don't even live here. So they own the land, but they don't live in the area. It's called an absentee landowner. It's a problematic situation, right? We've got uh, really uneven drug use rates that are higher, and we don't fully understand those. We have high mortality rates as part of that. We have pockets of really high mortality rates for lots of very specific diseases, things that are treatable. We have uh, limited economic options in certain parts of Appalachia, particularly, again, that central region. And also, just deindustrialization has hit us differently because we don't have other jobs to um, basically turn to when the manufacturing mills are closing. As such, we're also seeing people leaving some communities and trying to start a new life outside of Appalachia, sort of a repeat of the Great Migration in which lots of people were leaving Appalachia to work at industrial mills in places like Chicago. Likewise, you know, I don't know if you've noticed, but things are changing in how coal is working and the demand for coal in the United States. This is all sort of a situation that is impacting all of Appalachia. But yet again, I return to this idea of focusing on that central part of Appalachia, places like West Virginia and Eastern Kentucky, to really understand how hard this part of Appalachia has been hit by these issues. We also have to understand, too, that these problems, they intersect with each other, they influence each other. Like having few resources also relates to the fact that we have high mortality and high medical issues. It's just a big ball of problems. So we got to understand some of the things that are happening here and try to find a way forward.
So to make sure that we get a thorough understanding of social change in Appalachia, we're going to do a couple of things. We're going to do, first off, what George Vincent was really telling us to do. We're going to get out there and try and document some of these things. We're going to study these issues happening in the Cumberlands, as he liked to say, as a case study for all of Appalachia to try and understand um, what we see here happening so that we can understand other areas. Now, a couple of things about this. First off, we are going to spend time in this class getting some theoretical perspectives and theories under our belt so that we can understand the social changes that we're seeing and try to understand what it all means. Remember, theoretical perspectives are basically where we group multiple theories together to have a big picture of how something operates. A theory is an idea that's been tested over and over and over and proven to be true across case studies. We're also going to learn to do some categorical coding. Basically, these categories are going to be ways that we can note a particular kind of social change. In fact, you may have noticed that I've already started using it in this lecture series, and we'll pick that up in a couple of lectures. Um, but we'll be able to take those categories and apply them to some very clear examples so that you have some practice doing qualitative studies, but also in taking these categories and understanding the history of other places. Now, we're also going to study in depth two big case studies. We're going to look at the mine wars in West Virginia, a very bloody scenario involving exploitation, resource extraction, and all sorts of other stuff in West Virginia, and occasionally drifting across the Kentucky border. And then we're going to study the history of rock climbing in Kentucky's Red River Gorge, which is the story of people coming to Appalachia for a specific kind of activity and how that that's related to changing the area's economy, but also how these people have been changed by being part of this situation. Now, we are going to work on an assignment, and I'll have a separate video up talking more about that assignment soon, but you'll be able to basically practice again what we're teaching using your own particular case study. That's the basic guts of this class. We're going to talk about these more in detail. And also, I'm glad that now that we've gotten to the end of these two lectures, we have a clearer understanding about what the Appalachia that I'm talking about is. And we also understand that we're going to do, again, what George Vincent has told us. We're going to focus in on the Cumberlands. We're going to think about the social problems and issues in this area. We're going to look at its history and social changes that have happened here. And then we're going to use what we learn to look at other parts of Appalachia. So that's where we are. If you have questions and comments, you can leave them below. If there's something that you'd like me to talk more about in this video, leave it in the comments so that other people can benefit from, benefit from that knowledge as well. I'll be happy to answer your question. That's all for today. In our next lectures, we're going to start learning some theoretical perspectives on social change and how we can use those to understand what we're looking at in places like West Virginia and in Eastern Kentucky. That's all for today, folks. I'll see you next time. Take care.